What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDG. Big dogs got to eat. I almost forgot the name of the fucking brand was for a second. We are continuing off of what we did yesterday. Our video yesterday were three running backs that I cannot stop drafting. Okay, I've been drafting a lot this summer or this spring, whatever time of the year. I've just been dra I've just draft and draft and draft all year. It doesn't matter what fucking time of the year. It doesn't matter what it says on the calendar. All I do is draft. And there's three running backs that I cannot stop drafting. And that's what we talked about in yesterday's video. We're doing the same thing today with wide receivers. Okay. Wide receivers are a lot more boring than running backs, but listen, you hit on a couple fourth, fifth, sixth round wide receivers, and you're gonna be looking you're gonna be looking pretty when the cold weather rolls around. You got them fat running backs in rounds one, two, and three. You got them Eddie Lacy dudes stacking the top of your team. And then you just need a little bit, you need a little bit of upside with the wide receivers. And there are some dudes that are that are dropping into the later rounds for whatever reason that I can't stop drafting. They're my they're my highest owned wide receivers on underdog fantasy right now. Okay. If you want to come draft with me, if you want to be ahead of the curve, it's always on underdog fantasy. Underdogfantasy.com. You're gonna use the promo code BDGE. And when you do that after you deposit, you're gonna get three dollars to play with on top of whatever you throw down. So you throw down ten bucks, you're gonna get thirteen dollars in your account. That's big fucking money. In this economy, $13 goes a long way. It's like fucking nine chicken McNuggets, all right? Tony, I'm here for you, baby. How Shin. many nugs do you eat in one sitting? A hundred. Today's video, three wide receivers that I cannot stop drafting in 2021 fantasy football. Must own wide receivers, must draft wide receivers, whatever you want to do for SEO, we're all in. So we're going to tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. <laughs> The first receiver up on this list I take as a personal attack from everybody out there in the industry. In the industry, whether you're just a, a plain and pure drafter or someone who's watched one of my videos, y'all are the cause of this ADP right now. And it's Julio Jones. Julio Jones currently going off the board at the 405 as the wide receiver 16. This ADP, again, is per underdog fantasy. I will put the link down below to download the underdog app immediately. It'll take you to the Google store. It'll take you to the iOS store. Download the app. They have the rankings. They have the ADP. And these are all paid leagues. So you know the ADP is legit. It's the sharpest ADP in the world. It is one quarterback ADP, which means that that 405 is likely a fifth round pick in super flex drafts. Any negativity concerning Julio Jones should be saved for literally nobody. You say some negative shit about Julio Jones, I'm blocking you and I'm reporting you to the correct authorities. By authorities, I mean animal, all right? I'd rather deal with the actual police than I would animal. So Julio Jones slander goes straight to animal. And the big rumor reports or whatever going around are that Julio Jones probably going to be moved after June 1st. I'm going to proceed in these drafts or in this content, in the remaining con Honestly, even if he gets traded, I'm just going to pretend he's still a member of the Falcons because I, I don't want to live in a world where he's not a Falcon. I'm going to proceed as if he does not get traded, all right? And he's going to be on the Falcons for this upcoming year. This feels 100 bajillion percent like Adam Thielen last year. I have a, a way of looking at older players. For the most part, when you're looking at older players, and this is just a general strategy in fantasy football that has worked pretty well for me over the last few years. With older players, a lot of the times you see them play and you're like, they're past their prime, okay? They're past their prime. Once they are past their prime, it is wildly difficult to get bike into the prime. And by past their prime, I mean athletically they're not where they used to be okay so you see a guy like david johnson you see a guy like todd Gurley. they start to lose their explosiveness those are guys off my fucking board off my board o m b um um we call todd todd Gurley and da david johnson um players off the boards is there a time and place for them in redraft yes there will be times where they fall and 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 you could take them. These are the types of players I don't touch in Dynasty. I don't care how far they fall in Dynasty. I don't touch the older players if they're past their prime. Is there a black and white consensus on whether or not you're past their prime? No, but I'll fucking tell you who's past their prime and who's not. And that becomes black and white consensus. Older players past their prime, we do not touch. There are older players who, yes, they might not be in their exact physical prime, but they're dropping in drafts because of something that happened the previous year. Their statistics were down. They had injuries or whatever. That is when you need to take more context around what's happening with that player. So there's two types of players, right? If you're old 
and you're dropping to a value, it's likely because something happened last year. And most of the time it's injury related. So we break this down into two injuries. We break it down into serious injuries and we break it down into non-serious injuries. So if you're an older player and you dipped off and it's because you had a serious injury the year before, I'm off that player. And by serious injuries, I mean knee injuries, ankle injuries, Achilles injuries, and long time frame type of injuries in terms of recovery. So you're talking about tears, talking about broken bones, you're talking about things like that. Those are the players I'm staying away from. As you start to get older, it's harder for you to recover quickly from those serious injuries. If you're an older age, you're probably not getting back to your prime. Then there's the third category of these older players who suffer injuries in which they're not serious. You have the hamstring pulls, you have low ankle sprains, you have shit like that in which the offseason recovery will be more than plenty of time for them to get back to what they were athletically in the year prior. And when you look at a guy like Julio Jones, right? We look at Adam Thielen. He had a fantastic fantastic year in uh in 2018. Then he has like then he was like the wide receiver one in the first 6 weeks of the season in 2019. Then he hurts his hamstring and it plagues him throughout the entire year. Is is he gone? Is he gone from the NFL? Did he lose all of his athleticism which he didn't really have to begin with? He's just a great route runner and a great wide receiver. No, same player on film just had the hamstring injury. So last year was an easy buy on Adam Thielen. Julio Jones, same thing this year and we're going to look at the context of the games that he played in last year and i'll tell you exactly why he is the adam Thielen of this year julio jones dealt with a hamstring injury for the majority of last year but when you look at what he did when he was not dealing with the hamstring injury it's super encouraging what we're going to do right now is pretty much walk through a timeline of julio jones's 2020 season he suffers a hamstring injury in the preseason okay it was like you know midway through the summer like later into august and it's a little bit of a concern for sure. Anytime you, you're you're dealing with a hamstring injury or a pulled muscle or whatever later on in the summer, it's usually a guy I stay away from. Julio Jones rests the entire second half of the summer, whatever he needs to do. Comes into week one. Apparently, he's still a little bit at limit at practice. Week one, he goes off 12 targets, nine catches, 157 yards. Typical Julio game. Week two against the Cowboys, he has a bad game. Two of four targets, 24 yards. He dropped what should have been a 42-yard touchdown from Russell Gage. So he catches that normally what he typically does. And you're looking at a fine Julio game, 70 yards and a touchdown. Dirk Cutter comes out after that game and says that the hamstring injury is actually much worse than Julio's letting on. And when Dirk Cutter says that, I mean, you know, coaches and, and players talk about injuries all the time. We don't really know what to believe, but that's pretty much confirmed because he goes on and uh, misses week three. And then week four, he retweaks it. And he plays on just 21% of the snaps in week four. And then he misses week five. So you have week one where he goes up, week two where he kind of retweaks the hamstring injury. And then that plagues him from weeks two until weeks six. He returns in week six. And what does he do? These are his numbers from week six through nine. Eight for 137, two touchdowns. Eight for 97. Seven for 137. Five for 54, and a touchdown. They have the bye week in week 10. Week 11, the hamstring injury resurfaces. He plays on just 36% of the snaps before leaving the game in week 11. He misses the rest of week 11. And week 12, for that, he returns in week 13 versus the Saints. Posts a light 6 for 94. And then misses the remaining four games with the hamstring injury. So the entire season was plagued with this hamstring. And obviously that hamstring, it's not like it was torn. It's not like it's off the fucking bone. It'll be well rested and good to go for 2021. I know a lot of you guys are going to be like, Julio Jones is always hurt. Fact, not opinion. He has never, ever, ever missed a game in the NFL in his entire career because of an ankle injury. Has he left a game in like the third quarter because his ankle acted up? Yes. But has he actually ever gone into a game where they're like, you're not playing because of an ankle injury? Never happened before. But here's the takeaway from this. In the games that he played when he was not fucked up by the hamstring injury, Julio went nuts. Okay. So I wanted to get the sample size of those games. I looked at the games in which he played more than 40% of the snaps last year. Okay. So AKA the games that he didn't injure himself. Because if he injured himself, he probably played in fewer than 40% of the snaps. Those were the two games. We have a seven-game sample size. In that seven-game sample size, he was the wide receiver three in fantasy football, and his 16-game pace in that seven-game sample size in which he played more than 40% of the snaps, 142 targets, 103 receptions, 1,600 receiving yards, seven touchdowns. All right, people, 103 catches, 1,600 yards, seven touchdowns. So fucking knock it off with the late, fourth round Julio type shit. The hamstring injury is something that will heal up. He will be fine going into this year and he will not be off the Falcons roster because I fucking said so. Okay. Imagine drafting two to three workhorse running backs, or if you're in a super flex league, you get two to three workhorse running backs, your quarterback one, and then getting Julio Jones as your wide receiver one. I'm excited for Arthur Smith to come to Atlanta. They're going to implement a play action, heavy offense. Um, it's going to be fun to see these guys get open and have less 
coverage downfield because in a play action offense, safeties kind of have to play a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage. And who can beat these motherfuckers deep? Julio Jones with a hamstring that is in. Tact. Julio Jones, one of the easiest buys for me in rounds four to five of fantasy football drafts this year. Another player is a little bit more polarizing is we're going to get into him in a sec, but we want to speak about polarizing, right? We, some sunglasses are polarizing. These, these, uh, these glasses by Felix Gray are the opposite of polarizing. Polarizing means, you know, there's two sides of the discussion. I love these or I hate these. Everybody loves Felix Gray including myself. I've been rocking these for like two to three years. As you guys know, these are blue light blocking glasses. If you are anything like me where you're staring at screens all day, it can affect your sleep. Your eyes get extremely irritated. I know a lot of you guys are going bike to work now that the country is opening up. You're going to be in your office. You're going to be sitting there and staring at your computer all day because now you have to fake stare at your computer all day. You know, at least when you were working from home, you know, you could like pretend to be on your computer and you don't really need to be doing that, right? You can go out for a walk. You can go to the gym and you're not really looking at your computer for 10 hours a day. You're back in the office. You're, 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 your boss is going to be walking by and you got to be staring at the screen and pretending that you're doing some bullshit on Excel, even though half of you probably don't even know how to use Excel. But that's where these bad boys come in. I can't like passionately pitch a product on my channel more than I can Felix Gray because I so strongly believe in the product. FelixGray.com. They have these blue light glasses. They got tons of different styles. They got different colors. If you use prescription glasses, you can get a combination of prescription and blue light all in one. My vision is fucking beautiful. Thank the Lord. Thank the fantasy lords for my vision. These things are incredible. You put them on after like 6 p.m. and you don't have to worry about sleep problems anymore. If you're someone that stares at your screen all day, you know, you stay dropping your screen on your fucking forehead. You stay dropping your phone on your forehead or whatever. That's going to be the only problem. It's not only going to not ruin your eyes anymore, but it actually will protect you as well. Because if you drop your phone on your face, boom, that's why so you see that little scratch right there. I'm going to need to re-up on my glasses. I got a scratch going across here because I'm fine staring at my screens all day and letting it drop on my on my face. FelixGray.com or these blue light glasses. If you're staring at screens all day, I cannot recommend these enough. I also cannot recommend Deontay Johnson of the Pittsburgh Steelers enough. He's a polarizing player. I get that because the Steelers offensive skill players are plentiful and the offense itself in terms of scoring and efficiency is not so plentiful. When we look at his ADP, Deontay Johnson currently being picked at the 512, 60th overall as the wide receiver 20. Five. And I get it. There's a lot not to like about this situation because there's a lot of other pieces in the offense to like. Big Ben stinks. Uh, they re-signed Juju. That would have opened up some more targets for Deontay and Chase Claypool. Chase Claypool is obviously a very young and ascending talent up the depth chart and just in the NFL in general. This is going to be a second year, so he's probably going to pop off a little bit more than he did the previous year. They add in Najee Harris, so now they actually have a running back that catches passes. But at the end of the day, I just think Deontay Johnson is one of the best pure receivers, separators, route runners in the NFL, and he's coming off a season in which he had 144 targets in 15 games. Finished with 88 catches, 923 receiving yards, seven touchdowns. 144 targets in 15 games. It's a whole lot of ass. That did not factor in the concussion he suffered early in week three, which caused him to miss that game. You look at this this tweet from FF underscore Flavortown. For all my Deontay Johnson truthers out, truthers out there, his concussion early in the season likely played a large part in his drops. Post-concussion, you can experience dis decreased spatial awareness without showing true concussion symptoms. Don't worry about his drops. That was one of the big problems, obviously, with Deontay Johnson. He was getting benched sometimes for his drops. He couldn't catch the ball. Not catching the ball seems to be a little bit of a problem for a professional ball catcher, right? Like that, that, that seems to be something that would be okay to be worried about. But we have sort of an excuse. And you have the concussion in which he came out of week three. You have the back injury in which he came out of week five. He played in 24% of the snaps in the concussion game. He played in 8% of the snaps in the game in week five in which he left with the back injury. Uh, the back injury was clearly serious. It forced him to miss week six as well. That was the one game that he missed because he had, let's say it together again, 144 targets in 15 games. Uh, he also dealt with this toe injury that lingered pretty much all season and it, it forced him to miss a bunch of practice. So you look at what he did in the regular season and then you can look into the playoffs. The first game, the first round game against the Cleveland Browns, 16 targets, 11 catches, 117 yards. So here's what I want to do. In in the same vein that we took out those, those games from Julio in which he played in like 20% of the snaps because he left with an injury, I want to do the same thing with Deontay Johnson. If you take out the two games, which he left the concussion in the back early because he played in 20% of the snaps. 
his 16 game pace for the rest of his numbers 167 targets 107 catches 1140 receiving yards and 8.6 touchdowns and that is not factoring in the playoff game you want to factor that shit in the stats wouldn't be fair okay there would be no point in me making this video and i get it i get it everyone's going to harp on this yards per target number that he put up last year you get 140 plus targets you should be putting up a thousand receiving yards i get it no question about it the drops did not help he got benched for the drops. It's very it's very widely known. You look back at his rookie season, though, he had a 3.3% drop rate. That was not even top 75 in the NFL. So I'm willing to chalk it up as a bad year, something that maybe the concussion played into, just focus drop, something that he's going to be focusing on this season to make sure it doesn't happen again. I don't think it'll play that big of a role in 2021, but there also wasn't a ton that he could do with what Big Ben gave him. You look at his catchable target rate, you look at his target quality rating, 65th and 88th in the NFL among wide receivers. There's nothing we could really build off of that. You can't say like, well, they got a better quarterback. Big Ben's going to be better, but like, I don't think he could be much worse than he was last year. He was just, he's just a skeleton of himself. So at worst, I think he'll be around the same. I don't think this offense is going to change very much either. they will be a little bit more run heavy with Najee Harris, but I think that also uh, takes pressure off of the wide receivers now that they'll have a little bit of a run game. But it should, it should again, be like a very quick hitting offense where Deontay Johnson soaks up and eats up those 10 targets per game by the line of scrimmage, let him make plays, and then every once in a while take a shot on the deep ball. And again, at the end of the day, like you're going to choose who you want in this Pittsburgh receiving group, and I don't blame you for taking Chase Claypool. I just think Deontay Johnson is an awesome player who had uh, an awesome rookie year that it got overlooked because there were so many really good wide receivers that year. Um, he was great again last year as a sophomore, and while he was a little bit less efficient as a sophomore, we saw the volume go up, meaning he can command those targets. He's more of the Antonio Brown to what Juju did than anything else, and I think he's a very similar player, and he just continually measures as one of the best route runners and separators in the NFL at the position uh, per Matt Harmon's reception perception, right? We could say all we want about that, but when we have a dude like Matt Harmon actually putting in the work and showing us, is this guy actually separating? Is he one of the better route runners? And he comes away notoriously as one of the elite route runners in the NFL, it makes me feel a lot better. This just feels like a don't think too hard about this kind of thing. Yes, there were a few hiccups last year with Deontay Johnson's game, but I'll, I'll be drafting Deontay Johnson and a lot of him if he's going in the, I mean, that was a 5-12 in one quarterback leagues. This is a super flex league. He's probably going at the end of the sixth, early seventh round, and I will smash that draft button all day. Uh, I also will be drafting some Chase Claypool too. I like both of those guys, okay? I have about zero desire to draft Juju anywhere, even at, in a mid seventh round price tag in one quarterback leagues. I will not be touching Juju anywhere anywhere. I didn't want him last year, continually will not want him this year. Uh, I will be getting Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool and a lot of them in a lot of my drafts. The last wide receiver that I cannot stop drafting this year is, well, before I do that, before I do that, drop some of them down below in the comment section. While you're down there, hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video. Drop some knowledge on me with uh, a couple of the wide receivers or running backs, whatever the fuck you want to do, that you keep coming away from drafted in every underdog fantasy draft that you've done so far, okay? Underdogfantasy.com, number one place to draft, number one place to play best ball if you're not familiar with best ball yet. Really fun. All you do is draft. You don't have to do any in-season management. Come back in January, collect your winnings from the league. Underdog Fantasy, the link will be down below in the description to download it from the App Store. Use promo code BDGE for $3 absolutely free to come draft with me on the app. Who is your must-own wide receiver this year? The third and final guy on this list for me, Cortland Sutton of the Denver Broncos, man. Current ADP at the 605, 65th overall wide receiver 28. Like he seems like the most obvious candidate to take himself from this like mid-round wide receiver to jump up to the wide receiver one, like elite fantasy wide receiver when all things are considered and he's built like an alpha he plays like an alpha but he's obviously coming off the torn acl which happened in week one okay and that's what accounts for the six round adp happened in week one so he's going to be a full year removed by the time this nfl season starts we know now a full year removed is, is pretty good time length in terms of coming back from the injury and being fully healthy and physically being you know underneath yourself and, and being able to run the routes and being able to cut and all that so you have the acl accounting for some of the adp then you got drew lock and teddy bridgewater probably the other reason that he's dropping all the way into the sixth round because we don't know what the fuck they're doing at quarterback, okay? Only Animal knows because Animal knows that Aaron Rodgers is going to be a Denver Bronco after June 1st. Aaron Rodgers is officially a Bronco. Aaron Rodgers to the Denver Broncos, it's simple, it's locked up, it's going to happen already. They're not rumors. It's just facts. This kind of like uh, 
Deontay Johnson, for me, is just a, a total talent play, man. If you want to fade him in redraft and you want to wait until he's two years removed from the ACL, I can understand that. Or you want to wait until Denver actually has a real quarterback playing under center. I also understand that. But Sutton's ceiling is incredible for someone that you can get as your wide receiver two or wide receiver three in fantasy drafts right now. I, I mean, just look back to 2019, like how good he was ascending. That was his second year. He took that, you know, when we look at fantasy wide receivers, there's usually a trajectory for the guys who become elite. You have a, a really solid rookie year. You take a really big jump the sophomore year, and then you're basically elite by year three. Look at the sophomore year, 125 targets, 72 catches, 1,112 yards, and six touchdowns. Like that is the premier sophomore jump that tells you he's going to be the next elite player. And I know, I know people are going to bitch and be like, but did you see what Cortland Sutton did with Drew Locke at quarterback over the last five weeks of the season? Like, did you see what your fucking mother did in 1972? Bench. Sorry. Are we going to fucking act like Joe Flacco and Brandon Allen was the reason that Cortland Sutton was good in 2019? All right. Listen, like Drew Locke might be bad. Yes, but he's not worse than 2019 Joe Flacco or Brandon Allen. Right. Like, I'm not even going to give you a year for Brandon Allen because Brandon Allen's just fucking Brandon Allen. Sutton's going to be good because he's good. End of story. It doesn't really matter what quarterback is under center. And you hear it often. You hear it often like, oh, the Broncos wide receiver group or weaponry group is is super, super loaded and it has a lot of weapons. And we don't know what the target distribution is going to be like. But realistically, this is going to be a funnel, right? It's Jerry Judy and it's Cortland Sutton. We know who the alpha is there. KJ Hamler, sure, he's an exciting guy. He's someone that you like to retweet his like fucking Twitter clips and he's fun and explosive. But he caught 30 passes last year without Cortland Sutton on the field. While he might be a little bit more involved this year, like he is not a player that you're worried about Cortland Sutton being on the field with a KJ Hamler, if he's even like the starting slot wide receiver there. And then you have Noah Fant, also a good player, but like he's not going to be averaging more than probably five, five and a half targets a game when Sutton is on the field. He averaged four targets a game his rookie year. He jumped up to about six last year. And again, that's without Cortland Sutton. So that's probably going to hover around five to five and a half targets per game. Leaves a whole lot of targets between Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy. I'm not worried about the target numbers. I think 130 to 140 targets for Cortland Sutton this year is very, 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 very realistic. Now, I don't know who the quarterback is going to be, but listen, if it's Teddy Bridgewater, as much shit as we give Teddy Bridgewater, he also supplied us with three top 25 fantasy wide receivers last year. One of which, Mr. Spaghetti Anderson, had 140 targets. DJ Moore at 120. Curtis Samuel had about 100 like, I have no question that Sutton is going to demand big target numbers and he's going to be putting up big numbers because of those big target numbers. Look for him to be back in full force. And if his ADP stays in the sixth to seventh round, he is one of the easiest drafted wide receivers in 2021. What year is it? 2021 fantasy football. No doubts about it. If he starts creeping up into like the fifth or fourth round, listen, there becomes a price for every man where we got to step bike a little bit and reevaluate the picture. But for right now, in underdog drafts, where the ADP is pretty fucking sharp, I've been grabbing Cortland Sutton in every 6th and 7th round draft I could possibly get my greasy fingertips on. Those are my three guys I keep leaving drafts with, all right? We got Julio, we got Deontay Johnson, we've got Cortland Sutton. Drop in the comment section, guys, you cannot stop drafting at the running back or wide receiver position. While you're down there, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're going to be doing tons of fantasy football content for the remainder of the spring and the summer and in season, of course. And make sure you're coming and drafting with me on Underdog Fantasy, underdogfantasy.com. The app link will be in the description. You click it, it'll take you right to your app store. And make sure you throw the promo code BDGE in there after you deposit 10 bucks to get an extra $3 on top of that. We'll see you tomorrow. On Fade the Public, because Fade the Public is bike, baby. Peace. All right. That's all we got for today's video. Mr. Antonio, Anthony, whatever the fuck your name is. Ant you could just take that shit out, Tony. I'm so sorry. I don't know. There's no need for that negative energy.